Okay, first of the free response or short answer questions uh, sections on here, it's actually called B2. And so what I'll be doing is I will have the question prompts up on the left-hand side of the screen, and I'll have the answer key on the right-hand side of the screen. So um, hopefully you have uh, one or both, or at least you can you know, see what I'm doing. You have both these things up, um, or at least some paper to write on. Uh, but the question prompts will be over here, so it's probably a good idea for you guys to also be looking at the question prompt because I know this is very, very, very small writing. Um, okay, so uh, these questions are more likely to be grouped together. So it says actually 51 through 53 is actually the same question with just a couple different things that we are doing. I'll leave that there. Uh, toy launcher that is used to launch small plastic spheres horizontally contains a spring the spring constant of 50 newtons per meter. The spring is compressed a distance of 0.1 meter when the launcher is ready to launch a plastic sphere. Question 51 says, determine the elastic potential energy. Okay, that is the variable that we have been calling PES, stored in the spring when the launcher is ready to launch a plastic sphere. Um, and we are also told the distance it compresses, if you remember the variable for that, that is X, we're also told the spring constant K. Really, all this is asking you to do is get in, is figure out what PES is. They tell you what K is, they tell you what X is. Hopefully you remember what the equation is. PES equals one half KX squared. All we are doing is plugging in for this. K is 50 newtons per meter. X is 0 0.1 meters, we have to square that we end up with a spring constant of, let's see here, 0 0.25 joules, okay? Don't fret too much if you're like, oh, they didn't give me space to work. There's plenty of space here for you to work out all that information, okay? There's your first, there's the answer to the first question. 52 through 53, what is actually happening here is they are giving you two points for the next question if you do everything correctly. One point is for the uh, correct equation and substitution into the equation with units. And the final point is for the question, uh, the correct answer to the question. So even if you're not sure what to do, um, if you can come up with an equation and correctly substitute into that equation, you might still get one point on this instead of nothing. Okay, it's always better to write equations with units. The spring is released and a 0.1 kilogram plastic sphere is fired from the launcher. Calculate the maximum speed with which the plastic sphere will be launched. Okay, this is a launcher that is horizontal, it says. So I'm going to make a little sketch. There's a little spring in here that is launching a ball. Okay, and that ball is getting launched horizontally. All right, the spring... Um, is compressed a certain amount. We want to know what the speed is when the ball gets to the outside, when it gets to the edge of the launcher. So let's say the spring is usually this length. This length is 0 0.1 meters. We want to know this is the initial state. Here's the final state with the ball going off that way. Okay, we want to know what happens. I'm going to make that a little smaller so it's a little more. We want to know what the speed of the ball is at the end. So we have an initial state and a final state. This is kind of leading towards, we started with an energy question. This is kind of leading towards, hmm, maybe conservation of energy would work here. And in fact, it actually does. Okay, so conservation of energy initially, we start with ET equals ET. This is our initial side. Here's our final side. We have elastic potential energy. At the end, when the spring is not compressed anymore, when the spring has uh, got back to its normal length, where did the energy go? Now the ball is moving really fast, okay? So it must have some kinetic energy. And if you look at the question, we are looking for the maximum speed at which it will be launched. Forces would not make sense to use here because if you tried to calculate the force from that spring, you would have to calculate an infinite number of forces because the spring has a, a, a changing uh, a changing length that it has been compressed each time. As it becomes less and less compressed, the force is going to decrease, okay? 
the force from the spring is going to decrease. You would actually need calculus to solve it that way. That is not a good way to solve this. Okay, we can't use forces. Um, this is not a constant acceleration scenario, therefore we don't want to use kinematics. Energy is really our best solution here. We figure out that the initial uh, elastic potential energy is equal to the final kinetic energy. We write both those equations. 1 half kx squared equals 1 half mv squared. Notice I have a 1 half on both sides. I will cancel that out. Um, I didn't really need to do that, I suppose. I could have just plugged in what I know for the initial for the elastic potential energy because I already solved for that, but I already crossed that out. I don't feel like we're racing it now. Spring constant is 50 newtons per meter, 0.1 meters squared. The ball is 0 0.1 kilograms v squared. Now, what I could do, and well, I'll just give you the answer. I'm fairly confident your ability to do algebra we get an answer of the velocity should be 2.24 meters per second when it's coming out of the launcher. A uh, common mistake would be to not take the square root. I believe you get uh, the square root of 5 at the end, or you get v squared equals 5. You do have to take the square root there. That is very important. Okay, so there's 51 through 53. Moving on to 54. This problem is actually on its own. 54 says uh, that we have two 10 ohm resistors that have an equivalent resistance of 5 ohms when connected in an electric circuit with a source of potential difference. Using circuit symbols found in the reference tables for, okay, found in the reference tables, draw a diagram of the circuit. Okay, we have two 10 ohm resistors. Okay, so we have, remember the resistor symbol is this. Okay, we have two of these. Now, the equivalent resistance, meaning when we combine the two resistors, their equivalent resistance is 5 ohms. Let's think about what types of circuits we know. We know that in a series circuit, the equivalent resistance, and you can see this in the reference tables, is the sum of all the individual resistances. If you add 10 and 10, you do not get 5, okay? In fact, 10 by itself is more than 5. That kind of indicates that this is not going to be a series circuit. Therefore, the option is we must have a parallel circuit, okay? Parallel circuit is one with two different, or two or more different paths for current to travel through. Matter of fact, we can see how many we need if we do, well, actually, we don't need to know how many resistors we have because we're told we just have two of them. Really what this question is trying to get you to do is draw a parallel circuit. It just doesn't say draw a parallel circuit. It gives you the uh, resistance of the resistors also gives you the equivalent resistance and expects you to know that this is a parallel circuit from that. So we must draw a parallel circuit. Every circuit, no matter if it's series parallel or something else, needs three things. First thing is a source of potential difference, a power source, an energy source. I have chosen to draw a battery here. Okay, there's my first resistor. Parallel circuit means there are two paths for the current to go through. There's my second resistor. I could have driven, I could have drawn this slightly differently. I could have drawn it in any number of ways, really, um, as long as there are two different paths. I have one path for current to flow this way and another path for current to flow this way. Either way, it's good. I don't even think you necessarily need to label these, but I will anyways. Now we're truly all set. Let's look at 55. The graph below shows the relationship between distance d and time t for a moving object. It's a D versus T graph. The very first thing you should be thinking in your head is the slope of a D versus T graph is velocity. The slope is change in distance over time, which means velocity. Okay? This is a constant slope. We know it's a constant slope because if we put a straight line next to it, the graph the data on the graph does not deviate from it. It is a constant slope. Do not mix up constant and something that is increasing but positive, okay? The data is increasing and it is all positive, but this is a constant slope. It does not get steeper or less steep. It is a constant slope, therefore, since the slope is equal to the velocity, if I could draw an arrow, that would be great. The constant slope means that this must also have a constant velocity. So, 
On the axis in your answer booklet, sketch the general shape of the graph that shows the relationship between the magnitude of the velocity, the size of the velocity v, and time t for the moving object. The constant slope here means a constant velocity. That means as we draw this, our velocity should not change. Okay, that, sh okay, that slopes down because I can't see what I'm drawing. Doesn't matter where you draw it on here because we have no numbers here, but it should be a straight, flat, no slope line. This indicates the velocity does not change as time goes on because we know the slope of this does not change. Okay? The rate at which the distance changes over time is the velocity. That rate does not change, therefore the velocity does not change, and the corresponding v versus t graph looks like this. Okay? That's from that's a blast from the past. That's from way back. Let's go to 56. We'll do 56 through 58, and then we'll take a break. Um, okay, so 50, uh, let's do this. Okay. Didn't realize everything was on this page. So a ray of monochromatic light passes from medium X into air. This part is not particularly important. That's for, I don't even know why they include this anymore. Technically, they, I, I guess it is correct to include it, but they don't even talk about it in the curriculum, so it's kind of useless. Um, passes from medium X into air. You can see the direction of the arrow showing the light propagating up this way. The angle of incidence of the ray in medium X is 25 degrees as shown. So this is the incident ray. And therefore, this incident, I should learn how to spell, ray. Therefore, this must be the refracted ray. Refracted ray. Okay. First thing they want us to do, using a protractor, measure and record the angle of refraction. So I had a whole bunch of protractors here, and now I do not know where they went. But I did have a ton. Ah, there they are. Here's a protractor. Record the angle of refraction to the nearest degree. Now you get some leeway with this, okay? You need to be within two degrees of what the answer key on the test says. So, uh, refracted ray, I need to measure, notice that the incident ray is measured between the ray and the normal line. I need to measure between the normal line and the refracted ray to get this angle, okay? I'm getting that it is about, so make sure your protractor is lined up correctly, about 40 degrees, okay? And you can verify the same thing on your packet. You should know how to use a protractor by now, okay? About 40 degrees, so make sure that you are measuring the correct thing, all right? Now, 57 through 58 says calculate the absolute index of refraction of the medium X, okay? Whenever we're dealing with refraction in this sense where we have light bending when it goes from one medium to the next, the way to calculate either the uh, one of the uh, angles, either incident angle or refracted angle, um, or the index of refraction of either uh, of either material, is to use what's called Snell's law. Snell's law says the following: n1 sine theta one equals n2 sine theta two. Meaning, this is the side that's the incident side. At least that's how I usually write it. And this is the side that is the refracted side. Okay? The incident side. That's where the incident ray is. Medium X, we don't know the index of refraction. We don't know this number that describes the properties of light in the medium. So we're going to leave that as N1. Sine theta 1 is the angle that we care about in the incident, uh, in the, in, on the incident side, where the incident ray is in that first medium. That would be 25 degrees. Please do not forget the degree sign. On the refracted side, the index of refraction over here, we know this is air. And if you look on the reference tables, you will see that the index of refraction of air is 1. So we can plug in a 1 times sine of angle 2, theta 2, the, uh, the angle over on our second medium, the refracted ray side. Okay? That would be 40 degrees. Please, please, please. Make sure that your calculators are in degrees and not radians for this sort of stuff. Um, in order to solve for, sorry about that, n1, 1 times sine 40 is just going to be sine of 40. We just need to divide both sides by sine of 25. We end up with this. There are numerous ways to put this into a calculator. Use whichever one is best for you and still actually works. Um, you could put parentheses around sine 40, divide by parentheses sine 25, that would work. 
you could figure out the decimals for each of these and divide those that would work.